The Sky at Night, now on BBC One with Patrick Moore. Good evening. Did you see the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus? On the actual night, I was clouded out. On the previous night, I saw it, and I took this picture. There they are, Venus, the lower and the brighter. Not important to them, quite spectacular. It'll happen again in the year 2016. But here now, a photograph of very different type, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, showing a star surrounded by clouds of material. You can't actually see the star, there it is, lighting up the clouds. And that is a very young star, much younger than our sun. But what happens when stars grow old? How do they age and how do they die? At this stage, welcome back to Dr. Helen Walker of the Rutherford Apple and the Laboratory. Welcome back, Helen. Thank you. First of all, would you say a bit about just how stars shine? A normal star, like our sun, is made mostly of hydrogen and it is this hydrogen which is burnt to give the star its energy. Now, when I talk about burning, I'm actually talking about nuclear fusion. In other words, bits of hydrogen build up to make bits of another gas. In the centre of the sun, we have the hydrogen, indeed, converted into helium by nuclear fusion. And that's right at the core of the sun, and the energy is then radiated away to the outer layers of the sun, to its atmosphere, and from there we have these convection cells which we see on the sun, and from the Earth, the Sun really looks constant. And so we call it a constant star. But later on in its life, it will become variable. And as a star grows old, we use this diagram, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, to map out where the star is going to go as it grows old. This diagram was established in 1913 uh, by two astronomers, Einar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell. I didn't know Russell. Um, I did know Hertzsprung, who died well in his 90s, some years ago now. And this diagram is of immense importance to astronomers. Indeed, it's a very important diagram. We have on the bottom temperature plotted against the brightness of a star. And this is brightness in terms of the sun's brightness. And along the main sequence, there are stars that are normal, like the sun, and then above the uh, main sequence, we have a region where we find giants and supergiants. These are red, cool, large stars. And then in the bottom left corner, we have the white dwarfs. They are s small stars. They're very hot. They're hotter than the sun. And they're very, very old. And also, of course, along the bottom, we have the sequence, the O, B, A, F, G, K, M sequence, which relates to the temperature of the star. And most stars spend most of their time, most of their lives, on that band called the main sequence, and there they are stable. But of course, their supply of hydrogen and fuel is not going to last indefinitely, and then things start to happen. It is certainly the case that once the hydrogen in the centre of the star is exhausted, um, we have two pr competing pressures coming into play. There is the energy pressure which is trying to push the atmosphere out, and then there is also gravity, which is trying to pull the atmosphere down. Once the energy is switched off, the star outer layers start to collapse. This heats them up, and so the hydrogen in the outer layer starts to burn, and this causes the star to swell up, and it moves into the giant region. We have a normal giants like Arcturus and Aldebaran in this region. Well, Aldebaran in, in Taurus, the bull, easy to find. It's in line with Orion's belt, and a nice bright orange star. Aldebaran is a nice normal giant and if we compared something like Aldebaran or Arcturus um, and put it down in the center of our own solar system, um, Arcturus for example is, bright, is large enough that it would actually stretch out halfway to the orbit of Mercury. Arcturus is a normal giant. If we had a star that was slightly heavier than the Sun, um, it would actually be a little bit unstable. And so we get into the region of the Myra variables and the RV Tauri variables. Um, the RV Tauri variables are sort of fairly regular. And then the Myras are less regular than these stars. And of course, Myra is the standard example for the class. Yes, Myra and Cetus, the whale, um, 
can be quite right. It's variable, all right. The, the period, the interval between one maximum and the next is just over 330 days, can be quite right. But on average, Mara is visible with the naked eye for only a few weeks per year. Otherwise, it's too faint, and you've got to use binoculars or a telescope. Mara is a very interesting star, and when we look at it with something like the Hubble Space Telescope, we actually find that it's not quite round. It looks more like a rugby ball th than a football, and it's a very extended atmosphere. If we looked at Mara um, with the, and put it down into the solar system, we'd actually find that it's so large that its atmosphere stretches out towards Mars mm. um, rather than the Earth. Amazing. It's a very large star, and it's also one that we've been observing since the 17th century. If we look at this light curve from the British Astronomical Association variable star section, we have here over 100 years' worth of data. And what we find is that no two cycles are quite the same. If, for example, we take 19, 1989, 1990, and 1991, we find that the peak is a different brightness, and the shape is different. And so it's certainly a case that it's not quite a regular variable. No, it certainly isn't. Um, I have seen Mara when it's been as bright as the pole star, but that doesn't happen very often. Mm. Well, let's turn now, shall we, to another kind of variable star, and probably the most famous variable in the entire sky, Betelgeuse, in the upper left-hand corner of Orion. It's uh, a very large star. It's not as regular as um, Mara itself, but it's uh, an enormously large star, and I think you were talking about it with Jasper because we can actually see spots on it. I was indeed. Um, last November, Jasper Wall joined us on the sky at night and showed us that amazing sequence of pictures taken by Richard Wilson using special equipment on the William Herschel telescope. And that showed the disk of Betelgeuse with details on it. The first time surface detail on a star has ever been imaged from the Earth. It's certainly a very impressive picture, but if we look at Betelgeuse at different wavelengths, for example, with the um, National Science Foundation's very large array, we get a different view of Betelgeuse. And what we find is a very, very extended atmosphere. And this in, in this case, in radio wavelengths, we're actually stretching out beyond Jupiter's orbit. And what we're looking at, and this is Jeremy Lim and his co-workers, is the very cool gas around Betelgeuse. And we're finding that there are several convection cells. They're convection cells like you find on the sun, yes. but there are very few of them, and they're very much bigger. And from these sort of convection cells with this cool gas, you can actually lose material from the star, which of course is something I find very interesting, because I like to work on the dust around the stars, which is going to form new stars, and it's this dust which has to disappear into space. And of course, clouds also blow clouds of soot occasionally. Indeed, the Arc Corona Borealis stars are a very extreme example. They're also in the giant region of the, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and they do lose an amazing amount of material, as I think you well know. Yes, indeed. Um, these Arc Corona stars stay at maximum most of the time and then suddenly fade. Arc Corona itself, in the bowl of the crown, usually on the fringe of naked eye visibility, and can suddenly drop down to a faint minute. I've got some observations here. I made myself some time ago. See that deep minimum down there? And that's because the soot forms, and then when the soot blows away, the star gets bright again. It's certainly a very classic Arcorona Borealis minimum, with this deep fall and then the struggle back to light as the soot vanishes away from the um, immediate vicinity of the star. Well, we are following the star as it ages. It's using up its hydrogen, and then the hydrogen is going to start to run low. And then quite suddenly, things begin to happen, helium ignites, and we have what's called the helium flash. That's indeed correct. And when we have this helium flash, it's as though the star instantly moves across the diagram back towards the main sequence. Uh, but, and in order to get back to the um, giant area of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, it has to cross what we call an instability strip. And when the star moves into this instability strip, it becomes variable. And when it leaves the instability strip, it stops being variable. At the bottom of the instability strip, near the main sequence, we have the R.R. Lyrae stars. And these are not very large amplitude variations. And they're very short. And so a star can pulsate with one of these um, in less than a day. But they're very hard to observe. They're quite faint, too. 
yes, they are quite faint, um, but they're quite fun. You can sort of observe one in less than a night. And all about the same luminosity, 95 sun power. That's correct. And um, they, once you get back across the um, HR diagram towards the giant area, the star will gradually move up the giant area, and it may make extra excursions back towards the main sequence. And at this time, it will cross the Cepheid area of the instability strip. Cepheid variables, named after the prototype star. Delta Cephei in the far north, not too far from the pole star. There it is, the W of Cassiopeia over there to the left. And Delta Cephei, always the little naked eye, and period, just over five days. The Cepheids are a very important group of stars because they have a very regular variation. And we have two types of light curves. Um, the bottom one is Delta Cephei itself, and that is a very regular period. And it can be used um, in conjunction with the fact that because the period is known, we also know the actual brightness of the star. And this is so standard that you, when you find Cepheids in other galaxies, you can actually use the determination of their period to tell how bright the Cepheid is there and consequently how far away the galaxy is. This has been used with the Hubble Space Telescope to find the distance for a galaxy M100. 50 million light years. It's indeed a very long way away. It's in the Coma Cluster and the Hubble Space Telescope has taken pictures at three different times of a very small patch of one of the spiral arms and in the middle of these pictures is a Cepheid undergoing its variation. And from this, we can find the period of the Cepheid, the brightness of the Cepheid, and consequently, the, bright, the distance to the galaxy. Of course, Cepheids then are invaluable standard candles in space. And of course, after all, the pole star is a Cepheid. The pole star is just about a Cepheid. It's been um, decreasing in its amplitude over the last hundred years. And it's now got to the point where the actual amplitude of the variation is only three hundredths of a magnitude. And so we think it's right on the very edge of the red end of the instability strip now. Well, we are coming on. We are running low in hydrogen. And then something else happens. And what happens when a star has to leave the giant branch? The star has a problem when it wants to leave the giant branch because, of course, it's um, a star about the mass of the sun. And to become a white dwarf, they have masses of about half the sun's mass. And so it's got to lose half a solar mass to get there. And this, has to be, this can be done in one of two ways, either with a gentle wind or dramatic events. And as the star moves across the diagram towards the hotter temperatures, the, the mass loss must take place in these different ways. And when we look at something like the egg nebula, what we're seeing here are arcs of material and some searchlights and these show the two different types of mass loss that are going on in this star. We have the gentle wind which has formed the arcs showing that the wind comes in gusts and is often interrupted and then the searchlights are telling us that there are periods when there's a fast wind and this is traveling at hundreds of kilometers per second and it's also got a lot of material in it and it's able to literally punch a hole through the gentle wind forming the searchlight effect. This is evidence of the dramatic change that a star has to make to become a white dwarf. And of course, a white dwarf is um, about the size of the Earth, mm. and yet a teaspoonful of white dwarf is going to weigh about 10 tons. So we now have this white dwarf with the planetary nebula around it. Planetary nebula, an extraordinarily bad term, in fact, because it's, a, it's not really a nebula. It has absolutely nothing to do with a planet. The best known example of a planetary nebula is, of course, the ring nebula. Mm. And this is one that's rather deceived us because we would have thought, looking at it, that it was a kind of round, symmetrical nebula. But in actual fact, we're looking basically at the cylinder, sort of looking down the barrel end on. And um, it's not at all smooth and symmetrical. We have hot gas in the middle, the colored blue, the helium, and then we have the cooler material around the edge. But you can see it's not a smooth nebula as we used to think. And then when we go on to other nebulae, like the very young Stingray Nebula, we see here something that's not nearly so symmetrical. But this again has the two types of wind. Um, there was first of all a slow, gentle wind which formed the main nebula. And then you can see holes which have been punched out by the fast wind with the more material in it 
coming and sort of pushing the material out, giving it this very odd characteristic shape. We have other nebulae. Um, there's the Cat's Eye Nebula, which is a, an older nebula, and of course that really is very, very strange. It's not at all smooth and regular, and you can see, again, that it shows the evidence of these large pieces of material being blown out at very fast speeds. And then again, we have the Twin Jet Nebula, Fiddle which is a very extreme example of the situation, where it looks as though the sort of material's been forced into two barrels, and um, it is the dust that determines the shape of these these lobes and material coming out from the uh, actual nebula. And this is a very dramatic example of what can happen. And then, of course, we have the Bug Nebula. I like that one. We have a wonderful picture now from the European Southern Observatory Very Large Telescope showing the Bug Nebula. It's a wonderful mixture of gas and dust. And, of course, the dust has formed from the material that was lost from the star um, when it became a planetary nebula. And this dust forces the gas to move round it. And so we get this very st strange shape to it and uh, the glorious colours in the gas. An amazing picture. Now, one thing, Helen, we've been talking about stellar evolution, stars changing from one state to another, and one star is actually being caught in the act. Yeah, this is FG Sagitti, and it is a real puzzle and very exciting object because back in 1880, we knew it was going to become a white dwarf and have a planetary nebula. And since 1880, it's been steadily getting brighter until around about 1970, and it's now beginning to fade again. But in 1880, it was 45,000 degrees, and it's moving all the way back across the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, back to the giant area. It's now about 6,000 degrees, and it's thinking about pulsating, and we're not quite sure whether it's going to become an Archerona Borealis star or a Cepheid. What's your bet? Well, of course, I'd like it to become an Archerona Borealis star. <laughs> Let's hope it obliges you. And finally, Helen, what about really massive stars, far more massive than our Sun? Well, stars more massive than the Sun um, if move around the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram a lot more quickly. Um, they get older much faster. And, of course, they make the most extravagant excursions from across the diagram. However, they can't lose enough material quickly enough to become a white dwarf. And so they go bang and they explode as supernovae. Tremendous stellar outbursts. Well, here's a picture of a star that will go supernovae. Eta Carini in the southern hemisphere, photographed there by the Hubble telescope. And that will go supernova. Tomorrow, next year, or a million years, but one day it will. But one thing we've said about Helen, our sun won't become a supernova. It will die, first of all, as a white dwarf, and then finally, as a cold, dead black dwarf. But you and I won't be there. <laughs> Helen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Don't forget, we have a web page, www.bbc.co.uk slash sky at night slash. And of course, our information line, 0891 and our CFAX number, 620. And when I come back next month, we're going to leave deep space, come right inside our solar system, near home, and Dr. Peter Catanor will join me, and we'll give you the latest news from the red planet Mars. Until then, good night. <laughs>